Hello everyone and welcome to today's Lab Tools webinar. I'm Catherine Lloydell, Associate Science Editor for The Scientist, and I'll be moderating our discussion. Today, our speakers, Dr. Osgan Gutka and Jyoti Sheldon, will be discussing how to resolve cell subtype specialization with SCRNA-seq and rna scope. We like our webinar to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and the speakers will address these during the Q&A session following the presentation. To ask a question, simply click on the Ask a Question tab and type your query into the question box located on the bottom of your screen. We'll try to address as many of these questions as we can during our Q&A session. Our webinar platform is user-friendly. You can expand the presentation window by simply clicking on the diametrically opposed arrows in the upper right-hand corner. This will maximize the display within your screen. The webinar will be archived on the scientist's website and will return you the link by email within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor, ACD. ACD, a biotechnic brand, shortens the path to personalized medicine and enables research, drug development, and clinical applications by unlocking the power of RNA. ACD is a leader in the emerging field of molecular pathology, developing cell and tissue-based research and diagnostic tests for personalized medicine. Based in Silicon Valley, ACD was founded and managed by experienced entrepreneurs in the life science industry. ACD's products and pharma assay services are based on its proprietary RNA scope technology, which has been featured in more than 2,600 publications over the last six years. It is the first multiplex fluorescent and chromogenic in-situ hybridization platform capable of detecting and quantifying single molecules of RNA in-situ. ACD has two product lines, namely RNA scope and base scope, in addition to a pharma assay services business. The catalogue includes more than 10,000 target probes and assay kits for single, duplex and multiplex RNA analysis. You can learn more at www acdbio.com. Our sponsor has provided us with some helpful resources related to SCRNA seq and RNA scope, and we have posted these on our resource list located on the left side of your screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Oz Gutger. He finished his PhD at Ecole Polytechnic Federal de Lausanne. EPFL Switzerland, followed by postdoctoral studies developing single cell transcriptomics approaches in the nervous system in the laboratories of Nobel laureate Professor Thomas Sitoff and Professor Stephen Quake. Since 2016, he has been leading a research group at LNU Munich. The Gokker group takes advantage of single cell sequencing technologies to reveal disease mechanisms. Um, Oz, over to you. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I hope my voice is coming nice. And thank you for the invitation, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here from my home in my pajamas to share our science with everyone. So let's start. I'm using Gokcha, but everyone calls me Oz. And here my email and Twitter address in case you want to reach to me. Today I will talk on how using two powerful technologies, single cell RNA sequencing and RNA in situ, most RNA scope. We use these two technologies to merge cell's transcriptome identity with its anatomical location. Technology always uh, has been the driver for studying cells. Uh, the term cell was coined when the first compound microscope was invented by Hoke in 16th century and probably a few hours later he turned the name cell by looking to the uh, dead cell walls of the cork and next uh, Golgi uh, uh, developed the Golgi staining and Kahal and others uh, had given us the new and penetrating insights about into the structure of the brain uh, as you can see here, the uh, brain uh, pictures of the neuronal subtypes. And later, 
we have the glimpse of the neuronal activity thanks to the development of electrophysiological uh, methods. Scientists in Allen Brain Institute classified neurons according to their shape and electrophysiological activity. But actually, these two features are not easy to uh, analyze computationally, and they are uh, quite changing depending on the cell states. Uh, what would be the better way to identify cell? Yeah, and cells are generally cells are mostly made up uh, by proteins, which are synthesized using RNA. If we can get all the RNA in a cell, this will give us a quite good idea on the cell identity. For example, within only three genes expression values, we can differentiate these five cell types uh, labeled in here. But for doing that, we need to get to the uh, transcriptome, uh, transcriptome information at single cell level as average of these five cells, uh, mRNAs, uh, leads to the nearly the same value. So when you pull the five cells together, you lose this information. However, it has been a challenge to get single cell sequencing data. The classical RNA sequencing procedure looks like something like that. It starts with a, a blender like a tissue homogenator, which uh, meshes up some millions of cells. Then we isolate RNA using this column. Next, we prepare this RNA into the uh, sequencer-ready readable sequencing libraries. And by the sequencing machine, read libraries analyzed by uh, computationally. And most of you probably seen this analogy before. Um, Bulk RNA uh, mostly resembles the smoothie. It's easy to drink, but you don't really know which fruit is inside. If there is a little bit kavana, you would never be able to sell, tell that. I actually think it's more uh, more resembles uh, like the Avengers movie. If you watch the Avengers movie, there's a good side, there's a bad side, but you have very little information about Hulk's anger management issues in that movie. To get the Hulk's anger management issues, you need to watch the Hulk movie. Single cell sequencing is like all the hero single movies and the bulk sequencing is Avengers-like movie. Easy to analyze, easy to watch, but uh, single cell sequencing provides uh, much deeper insight, but also the challenging and more time consuming. Actually, overall the process looks more or less the same like the bulk sequencing. Last 10 years we made tremendous uh, improvements on the uh, cell isolation and the amplification technologies that now we can amplify a single cell library in ways that we can uh, prepare a sequencing ready library. Uh, this cell isolation step is mostly done by a cell sorter or a droplet, uh, droplet based uh, major or a microfluidic tool. And next, there is a high throughput library preparation uh, step. And then same as the bulk sequencing is sent to a sequencing machine and then computational analyzed. We and others applied this technology to striatum, which is the fluorescently labeled here, yellow, green and red labeled region in the picture. The mammalian striatum is involved in many complex behaviors and yet it's composed of largely of a single neuronal class the spine projection neurons, SPNs, in short. We use the microfluidic and flow cytometry-based single-cell RNA sequencing method, and Arthur Saunders uh, et al. used a uh, droplet-based method to the striatal, uh, striatum, and more or less uh, reached a comparable result. This data describes the full range of the neuronal heterogeneity. 
with functional and anatomical information. Our, what I will today talk about is uh, a framework of uh, analyzing this data set and how we can get neuronal identity and from this information how we can uh, identify its discrete and continuous heterogeneity which relates to anatomy of the stratum. So let's start uh, from stepwise. First, uh, how we start, first we plot all our cells uh, uh, from single cell RNA sequencing data. Uh, here you see a TSNE plot. Each dot here represents a single cell which are placed close to the other cell with most similar gene expression, which results in the same cell types clustering uh, together. This plot reveals 12 major classes of cell types from immune cells to neurons. Spiny projection neurons classically uh, classified as D1 or D2 based on the, the, their dopamine receptor, dopamine receptor expression. And when you look this uh, expression of these dopamine receptors, red and green, uh, at this resolution, uh, our clustering method cannot separate D1 versus D2, which has been identified more than 50 years ago. Jeff Stan, an extremely talented PhD student, developed a clustering method using a truncated PhD that can resolve not only the known D1 and D2 discrete subtypes, but also two novel uh, uh, discrete subtypes. Here you see the only the dopamine medium spine, uh, uh, spinal projection uh, neurons, and uh, it divides into the four different subtypes. These major subtypes are discrete. What I mean by discrete, I will try to explain in more detail. Uh, what most briefly that only with few marker genes you can differentiate each of them from other one. To reveal their anatomical relationship, we used uh, uh, we decide to use RNA in situ main RNA scope, and for that we wanted to first validate how reliable RNA scope probes in general. Here we use uh, uh, we use uh, a knockout mice for mitogen inhibitor factor two to test the specificity of RNA uh, scope probes. As you can see in the wild type in uh, VT images, RNA scope images uh, provides uh, this uh, characteristic punctate uh, labeling. Each punctate represents a single RNA molecule. But when we use the exact the same protocol side by side in uh, MEF2 knockout mice, MEF is homolog and the HTRA1 probes labeled pretty much nicely as in the wild type. However, we detect no mRNA for MEF2 as expected. And this suggests that uh, out of the box, we can trust RNA scope uh, probes and use them to reveal the anatomical location of the, this heterogeneity of the cell types. For this, we first uh, decide to look to the four major discrete cell types. And the first cell type we called uh, islands of Kalerja by SPNs. And the marker of these genes are somewhat already uh, pointed out uh, the name of the uh, this cell type is specific location in the stratum the, uh, called islands of Kalesia. This, uh, and we confirm that using RNA scope probes here you see in the green. And uh, these cells formed uh, specific clusters in the uh, in the green regions of the stratum. Next, we check the D1H cluster. The D1H cells were intermingled with classical D1 and D2 cells in the dorsal stratum. 
and clustered in the ventro ventrolateral structures, primarily the lateral stripe of the uh, striatum and DMS regions, the green you see in here. And they express uh, TAC1, uh, PANC, and TAC2 together, as you can see, uh, three-color uh, three uh, RNA scope imaging. Finally, we check the classical uh, classical D1 and D2 neurons. As expected, and these are the blue and the uh, red clusters, uh, they uh, they show a very separate uh, clustering uh, and distinct clustering from each other, which are labeled red and blue in the image. This continuous, this uh, these were clearly discrete clusters, but uh, but uh, what we what we mean by the discrete cluster is each cell type is separated from each other, such as D1 versus D2, and these cannot be connected in a continuous manner. Uh, Jeffrey also de developed a, a measurement based on partition-based graph, uh, graph abstraction, uh, which called PAGA. In this visualization, D1 and D2 produce these disconnected clusters. And when we look to the D1 or D2 separately, we see many continuous gradients that are uh, on the left indicated. These continuous subtypes are common. We find 9D1 and 7D2 continuous gradients here in different colors labeled in the TSNE plots. Nearly all of those uh, are correspondent to anatomical regions of the striatum. So, here you see the D1 and D2 uh, clusters on the right. D1 clusters are labeled separately and D2 clusters are separately labeled and you see there is no gradient between them. Um, it's a nearly black and white separation. However, when we check the one of the continuous gradients which are marked by Uh, which is, for example, CNR1 and uh, cannabinoid receptor 1 and uh, uh, crystalline mu, uh, mu, we see a gradient expression. Here you see cannabinoid receptor, this gradient uh, in city imaging of the striatum from Allen Brain Institute, and we see this. Uh, expression increase dorsal striatum and disappear in nucleus accumbens site. And when we look to the opposing expression, which is crystalline mu, we see it's enriched in the nucleus accumbens and decrease in the nucleus uh, uh, and dorsal striatum site. And we wanted to confirm that in our hands and we ordered the uh, probes for the, these two genes. And using RNA scope, we uh, generate these beautiful images. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see, this conforms the Allen Brain Institute images. From the nucleus accumbens to uh, dorsal striatum, we have a beautiful uh, gradient of gene expression. In situ uh, quant uh, quantification of the cannabinoid receptor and uh, uh, crystalline mu, and continuous markers reveal a, a nearly a linear gradient consist, consistent of a 250-fold uh, change in the relative expression among the axes, which allows us to predict the location of the neurons quite accurately in that uh, axis.
Anatomic striatum is not only uh, divided from dorsal to nucleus accumbens, but striatum can be also divided into the components called patch and matrix, which are shaped by the dopaminergic inputs. We find the patch and matrix markers Kremen 1, SMR 5B, and ID5 form gradient in both and D1 and D2 uh, cells, but in a uh, different axis than the uh, uh, cannabinoid receptor axis, uh, which is orthogonal to cannabinoid and cream one gradient. When we look to the Ellen brain uh, at last, we see uh, cream and one and ID one matches the matrix and patch like staining, and we confirm this finding using RNA scope again using a three-color label in Kremen 1, SEMA 5B, and ID5, and uh, which can accurately localize uh, these continuous gradients of the patch and matrices within the striatum, as you can see in the image. And we uh, characterize it on the right. One of the subtypes we identified, novel subtypes we identified, uh, was the D2 SPNs, D2 HDR7. And these cells were co-expressed D1 markers PANK and TAC1, and also interesting that uh, expresses hydroxyl, tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the marker for dopaminergic neurons. We also checked other enzymes required for the dopamine metabolism, but they are not expressed. So we don't think these neurons pr producing and secreting dopamine, but uh, have an unknown function. These novel cell types located mostly in the medial shell patches, which we know, uh, uh, which the region we know involved in the addiction and uh, the similar uh, behaviors but how these cells play in this behavior is not known yet. So, uh, briefly, uh, our work provides a framework how to combine single cell RNA sequencing and uh, uh, RNA in situ to understand neuronal identity and anatomy of the various neurons. And more importantly, we defined how discrete and continuous heterogeneity in single cell RNA sequencing data relates to the anatomy. In the stratum, we showed that discrete and the continuous subtypes can allow us to uh, put sequence neurons into their original spatial location, uh, which guided by the RNA in situ images. And here you'll see the, uh, all the types of the neurons uh, we uh, identified where they are most likely localized in the color-coded map. Next, Joyte soon will introduce the Hyplex technology, which includes many of the genes I've been talking to you in my talk, and but. Uh, different than us, uh, she will show how to do this all these stainings at once on this uh, brain slide, which is which will would have been really simplified our workflow, and I'm looking forward to her talk right now. Finally, I wanted to finish up the uh, my talk with the, uh, summarizing my talk, uh, I try to exemplify how to use single cell RNA sequencing combined with spatial methods can uncover the vectors of cellular states. Uh, I focused on the uh, spatial location here, spatial context, but we can also can access to the many other informations, many other vectors are embedded in this single cell data set, such as cell cycle, B and T cell reporter, and if we are working on a disease, disease-associated cell types, and etc.
Finally, I would like to talk, uh, thank uh, for all the listeners to joining us and my lab, uh, all my students and my uh, lab managers and uh, administrations, as well as my previous mentors, Thomas Sudov, Stephen Quick, and Jeffrey Stanley, who developed many of the uh, analyzers in here. And uh, I'm quite sure that we'll uh, produce much better uh, data sets and shape the single cell uh, analyzers uh, 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 in future and also the Barbara Terraplane. Thank you. And now I would like to switch my talk to Jen. OK, thank you, all. As a reminder to our audience, you may ask questions at any time using the question box, and our panel will have an opportunity to respond after our next speaker. And that next speaker is Jodi Sheldon. Jodi works as part of the applications team at ACD, where she executes projects and collaborations that demonstrate and support novel applications of the RNA scope and base scope technology. Over the past few years, Jodi has worked in various areas of biotechnology, including genomics and precision diagnostics. Prior to working in the industry, she completed her master's in molecular and cell biology and a bachelor's in dental surgery. Jodi? Thank you so much, Catherine, and thanks everybody for joining today on this webinar. Uh, I hope you all are staying healthy and safe and uh, utilizing your time at home well. So um, thanks, Oz, for giving that amazing presentation and showing us the utilization of RNA scope in, in your single cell project. And I'd like to take this opportunity to go over some additional examples and give an overview of, of the technology in general. We know complex and highly heterogeneous tissues such as the brain, tumors, as well as processes such as embryonic development are comprised of multiple cell states and types. And the precise transcriptomic characterization of these tissues, it can enable identification of new cell types, predictive biomarkers, new therapeutic strategies, and much more. However, sorry, however interrogation of these complex heterogeneous tissues requires a highly specific, sensitive, and multiplex spatial approach with a single cell resolution. So coming back to that famous fruit analogy that Oz was talking about, except I'm jealous of his Avengers analogy now. So as we know, the traditional transcriptomic analyses have relied on bulk tissue such as qPCR, which provide an average level of gene expression in a sample, but you lose the spatial and single cell information. And of course, this is akin to a fruit smoothie, which is a delicious drink, but you can only guess what is in the smoothie. The advent of single cell transcriptomic analyses, such as single cell RNA sequencing, have now been able to provide molecular information at a single cell level. And to come back to that fruit analogy, you can now provide the menu and tell what fruit and how much of each fruit went into that smoothie. However, these techniques still don't provide you with how those cells are organized in a tissue context. And that is where spatial analysis comes into play. Single cell multiplexing spatial analysis that detect RNA can provide you with transcriptomic information and spatial organization while still retaining that single cell resolution. So now instead of an average blended smoothie with all these mystery ingredients, you can see all the fruit and you can see how it is all spatially arranged. So let's look at the technology overview for the RNA scope assay. The technology consists of three parts, a unique target probe that ACD designs against your sequence of interest. It consists of a signal amplification system that generates a high signal to noise ratio. And lastly, visualization of single RNA molecules as dots. The assay allows for spatial mapping of mRNAs, link RNAs, splice variants, and highly homologous sequences in cells and intact tissues. All of these can be visualized with either fluorescent or chromogenic labels. The assay can be performed on a wide variety of sample types. You can use it on FFPE tissues, on fresh frozen tissues, fixed frozen tissues, PBMCs, cultured cells, and also in some cases in whole mount. The two key features of the RNA scope technology are the probe design and the signal amplification. The oligonucleotide target specific probes 
are depicted as Zs to emphasize the fact that they have two regions linked by a spacer. The bottom of the Z complements and hybridizes to the target transcript, while the top of the Z is the base for the amplification structure. When the two Zs hybridize in tandem to the target sequence, it creates what is called a binding site, upon which a preamplifier can bind and the amplification tree can build. So after the Z pairs hybridize with the target RNA, the preamplifier binds to the top of the double Z pair. Each preamplifier can bind multiple amplifiers, and each amplifier will further bind multiple labeled probes. The labeled probes can either be a chromogenic enzyme or a fluorophore. This signal amplification strategy yields high sensitivity and allows for visualization of target RNAs as a single dot, where each dot represents an individual RNA molecule that can be quantified. Background is eliminated because the signal is dependent on both disease binding next to each other on the target sequence, which means that if both those Zs do not bind next to each other, then the preamplifier cannot form a stable hybridization, and the amplification tree does not get built. Consequently, no amplification of non-specific hybridization occurs, generating little to no background signal. A standard RNA scope probe will consist of 20 Z pairs pulled together that are designed to hybridize next to each other along the target region, allowing for a tremendous amount of amplification and signal potential. However, a minimum of only three Z pairs is needed to bind to the target RNA sequence in order to generate enough signal for molecular detection. Taken together, the combination of probe design and signal amplification ensures a high signal-to-noise ratio. So as Catherine mentioned before, ACD has two different technologies, the RNA scope and the base scope technologies. So what are the differences? The RNA scope technology is, can be used for mRNA or non uh, non-coding RNA detection that is greater than 300 nucleotides in length, while the base of technology can be used to detect exon junctions, splice variants, and highly homologous or short sequences. This slide summarizes all the assays that are currently available from ACD. We have chromogenic assays, both singleplex and duplex, in the colors brown and red, and these can be performed both on manual or automated platforms. The automated platforms that are currently used are LICA or Mantena platforms. The multiplex fluorescent assays allow it to detect up to four targets simultaneously in a single tissue section. The major difference between the multiplex fluorescent V1 and the V2 assay is that the V2 assay uses TSA dyes from Perkin Elmer, as opposed to the V1 kit, which comes as all-in-one kit. And the V2 kit can also be performed on the Leica automated platform. Now, if your target of interest is shorter than 300 base pairs, the RNA, it is beyond the RNA scope's detection limit. And in that case, the base scope would be the right choice of assay for you. The base scope assay is currently available on all platforms. Last year, we launched the RNA scope Hyplex assay, as Oz was mentioning. And this allows to detect up to 12 targets simultaneously on the same tissue section. I will go into more details on this assay later in the presentation. We do have a new assay, which is the microRNA scope assay coming soon. And if you'd like more information on this assay, please feel free to reach out to your local sales rep or uh, you know, send a uh, query on the ACD Bio website. The RNA scope technology has been widely applied for numerous technical and research applications for both academic and for biopharma companies. Today, I will focus on validation and spatial mapping of high throughput data, namely single cell RNA sequencing data using RNA scope. And just to keep in continuity with how Oz used his RNA scope assay in the field of neuroscience, I'd also like to highlight some of the key applications in the field of neuroscience. So challenging IC antibody targets such as GPCRs and ion channels those challenges can be overcome by using RNA scope assay to look at these targets in situ. You can visualize cellular activity and early immediate gene expression in a cell type specific manner using RNA scope. Dr. Oz did a great job to show you how single cell resolution and multiplexing capabilities of the RNA scope assay can spatially map and validate gene signatures and resolve complex heterogeneous tissue. Lastly, the brain has most splice variants over any organ. 
contributing to a tremendous cellular heterogeneity. With the base scope assay that detects short targets, one can now interrogate these splice variants in a tissue context. So let's look at how you can uh, include RNA scope into the single cell sequencing workflow. Current single cell transcriptome studies utilize dissociated cells and that results in a loss of spatial organization of the cell population in the morphological space. Validation and spatial mapping of single cell analyses can be obtained using assays that retain that spatial organization, such as the RNA scope in situ hybridization assay. The multiplexing capabilities of RNA scope assay, coupled with its high signal to noise ratio, enable single cell and single molecule detection of transcripts in the tissue context, providing confirmation of this high throughput single cell transcriptomic results as well as finding that missing piece of puzzle and adding spatial information to these data sets. Some of the applications of RNA scope technology in this area include spatially mapping a cell atlas, visualizing gene signatures of newly identified cell types, classifying highly heterogeneous cell types, confirming new therapeutic cell types, characterizing immune landscapes, identifying new immunotherapy targets, analyzing or predicting response to drug treatments, and also confirming some of the publicly available data sets such as the TCGA or the tabular mirror. So I'd like to go over some examples of publications that have utilized RNA scope in this field. <clears throat> Researchers from Stan Lenarsen's lab at Karolinska Institute created a molecular survey of the mouse nervous system. They analyzed 19 regions from the central nervous system peripheral nervous system, and enteric nervous system by single cell RNA sequencing, totaling more than 500,000 cells, and created a taxonomy of all identified cell types shown here in the bottom. RNA scope was used to validate the identity and spatial diversity of many cell types identified in this study. Here I'm showing the distribution of astrocyte cell types. RNA scope validated the distribution of the neurotransmitters SLC6A9, which as you can see was abundant in the cerebellum, and SL6A11, which was abundant in the olfactory bulb. In addition, ISLR and GDF10 marked the local astrocytes enriched in the olfactory bulb and cerebellum. And lastly, and most strikingly, detection of MFGE8 and AGT in the tissue context by RNA scope revealed a distinct border separating the telencephalon or the front of the brain from the diencephalon or the back of the brain. This is another great example by Mathis. It was a paper from Nature. Alzheimer's disease, or AD, is an age-related neurodegenerative brain disorder of which the molecular and cellular complexity remains poorly understood. MIT researchers analyzed over 80,000 single nucleus transcriptomes from the prefrontal cortex of 40 individuals with varying degrees of AD pathology providing a first blueprint for interrogating the molecular underpinnings and cellular basis of Alzheimer's disease. The RNA scope duplex assay confirmed cell type specific downregulation of differentially expressed genes, revealing significantly fewer excitatory neurons marked by the CLC17A7 with detectable NTNG1 expression in brain sections from Alzheimer's disease patients compared to no pathology patients. Another example, vagal sensory neurons that are necessary for the control of organ functions, such as cardiopulmonary and gastrointestinal systems, their knowledge on the complexity of these neuronal types involved is missing. Researchers from Patrick Arnsworth's lab at the Karolinska Institute present a comprehensive identification and classification and validation of these neuronal types in the jugular and no-dose-derived vagal ganglia. 25 RNA scope probes were used to not only validate neuronal types identified, but also to quantify the relative proportions of these neurons. And here we show some representative data interrogating the nodos vagal neurons. This is another very nice study, also from the Karolinska Institute, that identified 15 molecular subtypes of glutamergic excitatory neurons and 15 molecular subtypes of GABAergic inhibitory neurons in the spinal cord. 
In this study, RNA scope was used to not only validate the gene signatures of all the 30 subtypes, but also to create a spatial map of these glutamergic and GABAergic neurons in the cervical spinal cord. The authors in this paper, through single nucleus RNA sequencing, immune oligodendroglial cells, a population that express both canonical oligodendrocyte genes as well as genes associated with microglia, hence they were named oligodendroglia. And interestingly, these immune oligodendroglia cells were seen to be enriched in the human multiple sclerosis brain. They used dual base scope ish along with immunohistochemistry and they revealed expression of a microglia marker CD74 in oligo 1 and 2 positive oligodendrocytes in an MS lesion, confirming the presence of this hybrid cell type in the human MS brain. Another great example, channelopathies are disorders caused by abnormal ion channel function in different excitable tissues. Human CNS channelopathies cause a range of brain disorders However, ion channel function at early stages of cerebral cortical development is not fully understood. Researchers at Harvard describe an abnormal developmental disorder of the brain, polymicrogyria, that is associated, or PMG, that is associated with pathogenic variants in the sodium channel gene SCN3A. They found that SCN3A variants disrupt cortical formation and oral motor function. RNA scope was utilized to show developmental regulation and cortical sublayer localization of SCN3A. Allen Brain Atlas, single cell RNA sequencing, and RNA scope all three demonstrate that the SCN3A is robustly expressed in human cerebral cortex during fetal gestation, but it is downregulated after birth. Conversely, the SCN1A is lower during gestation and upregulated after birth. In fetal human brain, the RNA scope multiplex fluorescent assay, shown here in the gray scale on the right, revealed that the highest SCN3A expression was in the cortical plate, which contains immature neurons, while the adult human cortex showed very low SCN3A expression across all cortical layers. Lastly, I'd like to highlight this study in which authors from NIH performed single nucleus RNA sequencing to create an atlas of adult mouse spinal cord cell types and molecularly characterize 43 neuronal populations. RNA scope was used to confirm newly identified key genes for many clusters, including cluster DI1 marked by CACNA1E and SYT1, and cluster DE5 marked by SCNA and NECAB1. They then leveraged this approach to identify neuronal populations that were active following a sensory and motor behavior. RNA scope in fetal hybridization was used for validation of neuronal populations that were activated, as indicated by the upregulation of CFOS expression in response to formalin-induced pain sensory behavior. So those are some great examples of how RNA scope was used in single cell RNA sequencing workflows. Another technique that, that has seen a lot of uptake in the field using RNA scope is the dual RNA scope ish IFC or IF technique. And you already saw some examples of these in the previous papers. A great way to help further characterize cellular gene expression is to combine in situ hybridization with immunohistochemistry on the same slide to simultaneously detect RNA and protein. What we refer to as dual ish IFC can be used to characterize cell type specific expression identify origin of the secreted proteins, visualize cell surface markers with your RNA of interest, visualize RNA binding proteins and their target RNA, and dissect regulation of gene expression. Because of the similar workflows between ISH and IFC, including sample fixation, pretreatment, probe hybridization, signal detection, and data analysis, as well as the unique benefits of each assay described earlier, ISH and ISC are ideal to combine into one workflow in which the RNA scope ISH is performed first followed by the IFC assay. We do provide some recommendations to ensure success with your dual ISH IFC assay. First, all dual ISH IFC protocols require optimization. 
In general, it is recommended to combine a working RNA scope protocol with the working IFC protocol. In addition, work with antibodies and a protocol that are known and already established with your tissue samples. Second, it is advisable to perform ISH first followed by IFC. Third, it is advisable to optimize the IFC assay separately using the RNA scope pretreatment reagents to ensure that your protein can still be detected following the RNA scope pretreatment. And lastly, the dual ish IFC assay works better for highly expressed protein due to proteus treatment that is used during the ish protocol. I'm just going to go over some of the examples of how dual ish ish IFC was used by some of our customers. Hepatic stellate cells are a major contributor to liver fibrosis, but were previously thought to be homogeneous. Using single cell RNA sequencing, scientists at University of Edinburgh Center for Inflammation Research revealed two subpopulations of HSCs with unique gene signatures. The ones that are associated with portal vein and the ones associated with central vein. Now they combined RNA scope ish and IF to reveal zonation of the HSC subpopulation across healthy liver. And in addition, they also validated the markers associated with these individual HSC populations. RNA scope ish was also applied for the detection of activity and plasticity markers by the means of detecting immediate early genes. Immediate early genes are genes which are active, activated transiently and rapidly in response to a wide variety of cellular stimuli. They represent a standing response mechanism that is activated at the transcriptional level in the first round of response to stimuli before any new proteins are synthesized. Stimuli can be stress or behavior, amongst others. CFOS is a proto-oncogene that is a part of a bigger FOS family of transcription factors. And it is rapidly and transitly induced within 15 minutes of stimulation and therefore an indirect marker of neuronal activity. CFOS has been frequently used as a marker for neuronal activity in the brain of many different species. To detect neuronal activity in the mouse brain, we probe for CFOS along with GPCR, CHRN3. In this image, we can see robust detection of CFOS in green in both the CA1 and CA2 regions. Here is another technique that allows for characterization of complex tissues and spatial profiling at a single cell resolution. The image is a representation of the joint workflow between RNA scope assay and the nanostring GeoMix DS fleet platform. The process starts with identifying the targets using the RNA scope probes that will molecularly guide to your region of interest, followed by hybridization of the GeoMix probes and molecular profiling of the region of interest. The quantification is done using the nanostrain and counter assay. At the end of this run, the targets of interest can be further validated using the RNA scope assay on a serial section at a single cell resolution. The GeoMix DSP and RNA scope are individually very powerful techniques, but with a joint workflow, we can have spatial gene expression profile with high flexing capability while retaining the morphological context which is extremely significant for heterogeneous tissues like tumors. With this joint workflow, we have combined the best capabilities of both technologies while maintaining the technical feasibility of each assay. So now I'd like to go into more details about the Hyplex assay that Oz was talking about. This assay was launched last year. <coughs> and to show the utilization of this assay, we actually used one of all this project that, that he showed you in the, in the slides earlier. So what is the Hyplex assay? To fully characterize and spatially map the diverse cell types identified by single cell transcriptomics, RNA-based in situ assays capable of higher multiplexing are critical. ACD's RNA scope Hyplex assay allows researchers to visualize up to 12 targets on the same tissue section at a single cell resolution. With the multiplexing capabilities of this assay, researchers can A, find your population of cells by using a cell-specific marker. They can confirm your single-cell RNA sequencing results by simultaneous detection of additional gene expression target markers. 
They can characterize complex heterogeneous tissues by mapping of up to 12 targets simultaneously in the tissue context and identifying multiple cell subtypes. So how is this assay performed in, in comparison to the other assays? The way this assay works is you do signal amplification of up to 12 mRNA targets on the same tissue section by doing three iterative rounds of four targets each. At the end of the three rounds, you take the images and you register the images using the RNA scope image registration software, and you can toggle on and off the image, uh, the target of choice to look at the data of interest. That being said, this assay currently is compatible with only fresh frozen and fixed frozen sample types. This is an image that was generated by a customer that shows the cortical layers in the mouse brain using the Hyplex assay. This is the paper from Oz that he talked about earlier. This paper was utilized as a foundation to show the utilization of the Hyplex assay in the single cell RNA sequencing workflow. For the purpose of this project, we, we divided the experiment into three different types. We identified each of those D1 and D2 spinal projection neurons or the medium spiny neurons uh, by utilizing the Hyplex 8 reagent kit. And then we combined both the D1 and the D2 subtypes together to look at all of them on one section by utilizing the Hyplex 12 reagent kit. That being said, this particular project was also accepted for oral presentation at ASLG and at SFN and at the Cold Spring Harbor Lab single cell analysis meeting in 2019. We also have an application note that describes this project in detail. And if you'd like to take a look at that, you can go find it on the website. So looking at some of the data from this experiment. This is the data that shows the D1 subtypes of MSNs using the 8-plex eight, uh, eight assay. So eight targets were run in two different rounds, and the images were combined together using the image registration software. This is the data showing the D2 MSN subtypes performed similarly. And finally, we combined all the D1 and the D2 subtypes together to look at all the 12 targets on one single section. Now, if you see the image, there's too much going on. So how is it that the ACD's image registration software helps you analyze this data? We took an example. In the paper that we used by Oz, they identified a specific cell that expressed both the DRD1A and the DRD2 genes. The data that you can see on the screen is from the same image that you saw on the previous screen. The way image registration software works is it will show you all your 12 targets, as you can see on the left side of the screen, and then you can toggle on and off the target of interest and then zone into those specific genes to validate your, your hypotheses or to validate your single cell results. That being said, we have a lot of RNA scope publications coming out that have used RNA scope hyplex assay in the field of single cell. They're all currently available in bioarchive as preprints. And as soon as they, they're published in, public, uh, in journals, they'll be available on a website to view as well. The growth and adoption of the RNA-scope technology is best exemplified by the number of peer-reviewed publications. We had our first publication in 2011, and since then there have been over 2,700 peer-reviewed papers published using the RNA-scope technology in numerous journals including many of the top tier ones. The RNA scope technology is highly relevant across multiple fields of research, with our top areas being neuroscience, cancer, and infectious diseases. Furthermore, the incorporation of the technology in single cell sequencing workflows is demonstrated through a rapid growth of publications using the assay to confirm and spatially map single cell RNA sequencing data in the tissue context, with over 80% of these single cell papers in very high impact journals, including Nature, Cell, and Science. So to summarize, RNA-scope uses a unique probe design strategy to dramatically improve signal-to-noise ratio. We currently have over 15,000 probes on catalog, but new probes can be designed and made within two weeks for any target and any species. RNA-scope provides both quantitative and spatial information on your targets in the complex tissue environment at a single cell resolution. The newest assay base scope can detect splicing variants and short sequences down to 15 nucleotides. 
and the RNA scope assay can be complemented with immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence for simultaneous RNA and protein detection on the same slide. We have a lot of new webinars coming up to, to give more information on some of our new products and some of our existing products. But if you'd like to learn more, please visit our website at www.acbio.com. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact either me or our support team on the addresses mentioned on the slide. Thank you so much. Back to you, Catherine. Thank you, Jyoti. The audience has submitted several questions, so let's get to them. And most of the questions are about the actual um, technique, but we do have one here for Oz as well. Um, Oz, are there any publications um, you, you can recommend where readers can see your SCN research? Uh, sorry, I was, can you repeat? Yeah, are there any publications um, where readers can see your SPN research? Which publications you can recommend? SCN research? I, current research? I didn't understand what the word. Sorry. Oh, um, are there, which publications um, can readers see your research? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, for, I, so for that, the current talk, Hopefully there are new ones coming out in soon, and then which are in revision right now. But uh, uh, I could recommend Jeffrey Stanley Neuron 2020 and Gokche et al. Cell Reports 2016. Uh, these are two publications that the, my presentation were uh, was based on. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, Jody, we have a few um, questions about the, the technique. The first one is, what fluorophores does the Hyplex assay use? So currently the Hyplex assay uses four fluorophores, uh, the green Alexa Fluor 488, the orange Atto 550 or the Cyanine 3, uh, the far red Atto 647N or the Cyanine 5, or the near infrared Alexa Fluor 750 or the Cy 7. Okay, great. Um, so you mentioned running ISH and IHC together. Can you just describe that in more detail? Yeah, for sure. So you can combine the RNA scope assay with immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence on the same section. Uh, we highly recommend performing the RNA scope ISH assay first, and then you follow up with your IHC or IS. And of course, we recommend that you use val validated antibodies for the expressing protein targets. But I also say that if you are going to perform IHC or IF with your assay, you contact our support team, and they can provide you with more information on how the protocol would be run. Okay, thank you. Um, can dual-ish IHC be performed on an automated machine? Yes. The Leica Biosystems Bond RX instrument and the Ventana Discovery Ultra Automated Stainer are the two automated machines that the dual-ish IHC assay can be performed on. And what neuroscience-related probes are available for use with RNA scope? So some of the most popular probes that customers have used are GPCRs, uh, such as DRD1 and DRD2, especially because they're notorious for having poor antibodies. Uh, in addition, we do offer cell marker probes, such as RBFOX3, GFAP, AIS-1, uh, as well as markers for glutamergic and GABAergic neurons, such as V-GLUT, uh, V-GAP. However, ACD can design probes against any target, so you can submit your sequence or the NCBI accession number to a probe's design team, and they can design the probes for you. Okay, thank you. Um, what's the difference between the V1 and V2 fluorescent assays? The main difference is that the V1 assay is designed for use with fresh frozen or fixed frozen tissues, whereas the V2 assay is primarily for FFPE tissues. In addition, both the assays can be performed manually, uh, but the V2 assay can also be performed on the Leica automated stainer. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and how long does the RNA scope assay take to perform? The manual chromogenic RNA scope assay is, takes approximately eight hours. 
Uh, it can be divided for up to two days if you prefer. Uh, the fluorescent assays vary depending on which versions you're using. So the V1 takes a little as six hours. The automated assays on the antenna or the Leica automated staining instrument, it, that can take about 12 hours, but the, with only about 30 minutes of hands-on time. Uh, if you want to perform dualish IFC, that's between 11 and 14 hours, depending once again on which assay you're performing. Okay, great. And um, can you detect multiple targets at once with base scope? Um, yeah, you can detect up to two targets with the base scope duplex assay. In addition, if you want, you can also combine the base scope in situ hybridization assay from ACD with an IFC antibody to detect an additional protein target. Okay, thank you. And um, does RNA scope have applications for stem cell research? Yes, we definitely have applications in stem cell research. Uh, if you go onto the website uh, into a publications area, you can filter specifically to find publications in that field, and and you can you can see how researchers have used RNA scope in the field of stem cells. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, for Oz, um, is a question for you. Um, how can somebody access your SC RNA sequence data, uh, sequencing data in mouse striatum? Sorry, I was sorry to put it on silent. All our data, uh, sequencing data is submitted into GEO, uh, so the, uh, all the sequencing and sequencing tables are available online. Uh, and also we provided the expression tables as a supplementary without requiring any computational information. You can search for any gene, uh, which is a supplementary table five or six. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, that's all we have for today. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to the speakers directly. Their email addresses are shown on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the scientist website and you will receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I would like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today, and particularly, particularly those of you who shared your questions and comments. On behalf of the scientists, I'd also like to thank our speakers, Oz and Gioki, as well as our webinar sponsor, ACD. Thanks everyone, and goodbye.